Hey everyone, it's Julian from Invicta. We're gonna be doing an interview this time with Dr. Loris Chevalier, and he served as the historical advisor on the Napoleon film. So that's gonna be the basis for our discussion today, talking about the movie, uh, the movie itself, the history, some behind the scenes action, and what it's like to be a historical advisor. So I'll let Dr. Loris Chevalier here give himself a, a brief intro, and then we'll hop into Miro and talk through our, our talking points. Hello, Julien. Hi, everyone. So I am a, a scholar. I've got my PhD in medieval history, and I've been working with Ridley since 2019 uh, with Ridley Scott, the director of the movie uh, Napoleon. And I have been uh, working with him on the um, Napoleon projects between uh, 2021 and 2023. So that was a, a long experience on my side of things. Yeah. And uh, I have a lot of questions that I'm sure our audience will. I'm going to go over here to the mirror board. And basically here, we'll do similar to what we did for the, um, the Bronze Age collapse, where there's a big board and I'll be zooming in and going through our talking points. So just to give you guys a roadmap for where we're headed, we have a portion here on what it's like to be a historical advisor in general, what it was like specifically for the Napoleon film. After that, we'll be discussing the movie when it comes to the major characters. So Napoleon, his marshals, Josephine, maybe a few more, but those are the major topics of discussion. And then after that, we have major battles, the campaigns of Napoleon, some in-depth on Waterloo, and then perhaps a little portion on uh, St. Helena. So that's the overview of where we're going to be. Again, if you want to jump ahead, click in the description and you'll see timestamps or just scrub through the video and you'll see timestamps. Um, we're going to start here with the historical advisor portion. And let me just make sure we zoom in here. So you'll notice we have rough time budgeting and then we have some community questions sprinkled in. So we'll get started on what is it like to be a historical advisor. The first thing I wanted to say out the gate as we're approaching this discussion for the Napoleon film is um, just to frame it in your mind, this isn't going to be a deep historical critique of the film, either, as I said, from a historical perspective or from a kind of movie critic per perspective. You know, there will be room for both of those. Um, but the reason for having Loris on is more so to give us a behind the scenes understanding of why decisions were made uh, in the adaptation from history to film. So, you know, if I wanted to nitpick the whole time, this would be a 10 hour stream. Uh, you know, the same would happen for Gladiator or Kingdom of Heaven or any other film, to be honest. So just keep that in mind. This is not, you know, an opportunity to beat up Loris or beat up the film forever. It's just to, you know, get Loris's side of the story when it comes to what's it like behind the scenes and what were some of the, the thinking uh, behind some of the adaptations and decisions for the filmmaking. Um, but along the way, we will be mentioning some of the history. So we're, we're hoping to strike a good balance. So that's my my main disclaimer there. And I guess before we start, is there anything else you wanted to note, uh, Loris? Um, well, just, um, yeah, when you asked me, I think what, something that could be quite relevant is that my uh, PhD and my uh, thesis that took me seven years was based on history of mentality and, uh, and chivalric ethic and the mental analysis of someone in the past was a point in the 12th 13th century. And so that helped me out a lot in terms of uh, characterizing or finding in depth of an historical character and help an actor to put it all the way to the screen. So that could be quite relevant to um, my uh, background in a way. Okay, cool. Yeah, with those disclaimers in the mind, uh, let's go ahead and get started on our first portion of historical advisor. So first thing I'll ask is, uh, what is the role and responsibility of a historical advisor? We had some community questions that were asking, you know, uh, Crisco362 here says, first question, uh, what was your actual job? So broadly speaking, can you tell us what a historical advisor does? So I guess there's a, a very, there's as many historical advisors as there are ways to do the job because um, my technique, I can only speak about what I do uh, because I haven't been involved with any other historical advisor on set. So I've just learned the job on the spot. Um, so an historical advisor, there are several steps within the historical advisor. You could be a documentalist that's in pre-production. And then, so a documentalist, you 
get asked questions beforehand and you have to write an article about them or a file mostly with uh, pictures or documentations from the time and because i like to make things clear i always give all the sources uh, for the original sources of anything you want to inform or influence and then later in the conversation i think we'll go more into detail of specific things uh, and uh, then on set historical advisor you could be here to advise the actors uh, but you are mostly there for the director so you have to answer every question the director would have and that could be relevant or you could also advise him sometimes so move around next to him get closer try to approach uh, the director who is surrounded by the big crew as um, it could be up to a couple hundred people behind the camera on such production so you've got to work your elbows as we say in french in order to get closer and to influence him on an id you might have that could be very useful for a specific scene and uh, you're also here me i always consider myself not to be just uh here for the director but to be here for everyone so i like to introduce myself to every member of the cast every you could uh, advise the costume section you're definitely here for the production designer uh you're uh here for everyone every member of the crew whatever how um creative his job could be if he's got any question i think we have to be there for everyone and could help sometimes even the director of the photography would have a question on lits where the rooms and that could help him to give an ambiance to the room so uh -huh. the job is very very um uh, wide areas of knowledge and the um, and i can see afterwards there's another question uh, that is linked to to the the qualifications but you have to understand that there is a major difference between scholar work and uh, historical advising which is much more um less precise uh in terms of um in terms of research and um... okay yeah and this is this is a question that i had on honestly was what qualifies him or her for the job of historical advising i think more specifically i would wonder like how do you get tapped for that position or do you apply for it or how, how does that whole process work okay so so yes as i was saying in the introduction so i a lot of people uh in france were quite uh, in, uh intrigued about the fact that i am um a medievalist so i study medieval history how is it possible that i ended up working on something napoleonic i worked so i worked with ridley on the last duel i was the curator in the castle and we had a discussion with uh, the very uh, talented Arthur Max, who is the um, production designer of Ridley since, I think, since um, Gladiator, actually. And so since 25 years. And uh, we had a discussion with him. And he was like, oh, OK, fine, you're hired. So I ended up <laughs> working with him as mm -hmm. well as the castle. And then. I got called up to be an onset historical advisor on that movie, The Last Duel, which was closer to what I studied because it's based on the 14th century Normandy, where I studied the 12th, 13th century um, Levant, so the, the crusade uh, in Constantinople and Byzantine history. And um, so it's closer, but what it could be relevant for our audience today is that what I study, my subject, I can give you my thesis subject, is very con uh, precise. It is between the repents of a crusader and the preachings of an illiterate, what are the differences, what are the evolution, sorry, of chivalric ethic as a way of moralizing the laity according to the works of Hugues de Berzé? So it's very precise. Nobody's going to ever make a movie on that subject. And so 
what you have to understand is that when you work in the movie industry, you have to answer very quick questions or sometimes a very broad question, sorry. And so really liked my style of working with uh, he, he liked my style of um, sorry. Uh, he, he really liked my style of um, working on the last jewel. And because um, I didn't wait, I went to him and asked questions. And sometimes I asked if we could change things here and there. And therefore, he on the last day of the shoot of um, the last duel, he said, well, I'm doing a movie and then I'm doing another one, which is based on Napoleon, which is in a year's time. So you will work with me. How good are you? I was like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm not scholarly good on Napoleon, but I could be. And uh, had a year to focus on Napoleon and Josephine's relationship. So it didn't work with the production designer. I did not work with the costumers. I mostly worked for the relationship and the, the history of mentalities of the time. And also anecdotes and things like that. So we'll, we'll get more into that later. So that's how I got the job. Because I worked on a castle where it did... A recognition <laughs> tour and we met and it went out uh it ended up pretty well so that's it that's how um, all it all started yeah and it makes sense and i think you know i think that's something people have to keep in mind is you would think historical advisor go find the top expert in the field but there's a lot more to being a historical advisor than just knowing the information you have to be able to communicate it there's a lot of soft skills you have to be able to work on a team and it seems like a lot of the times in the movie industry when a director gets like a team behind them to create a certain film, it's almost like you see those people over and over and over again. So they kind of get dragged along, um, mm. which it seems like that's what your experience was. And it makes sense for a director. They want to feel comfortable. It's all about relationships. They want to be able to work nicely with the team, have someone who can stick up for themselves or, or speak out or, or be flexible and all that. So I understand that there's a lot of soft skills in there. Um, but that's the first thing that jumps out to me is that you have that kind of soft skill and nuance that means that someone gets selected who isn't from the other end of the spectrum, who's just super, super scholarly, um, you know, PhD exactly on the topic of the film. Um, I, I so think, just... for, well, the first meeting I had with Ridley um, was in, um, in 2021. And he said to me, he said, on Gladiator, I actually fired seven historical advisors. <laughs> So yeah. don't don't bother me with uh, with shit. Like that's what he said. Like don't 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 slow the process down. If you okay. speak, it's because you have to add something uh, to not to. If you contradict, and it's understandable. Um, there is a story that I could share, a very quick one. Uh, and it's the story about. Uh, I think it's uh, your fellow YouTuber, Lindy Beige, who made it out public, but it was known apparently in Hollywood, uh, is um, uh, the story of the historical advisor on Troy. He just mm. spent his time eating Mars bars because <laughs> once, and people like kind of mocked him in the end. He was a very famous scholar, but he just didn't understand why in the props there are nothing that look like uh, ancient um, spears and ancient weapon. He didn't get it. And he was like, no, I don't want to see those. Uh, and that one question, he, he really rejected the, the crew. And he said, I don't want to see those uh, awful spikes. They look like um, not nothing like Bronze Age time. They look like nothing. <laughs> uh, coming out of a spaceship. And so you really, um, really, if you really say no, and you don't have, if you have nothing to offer, then you're not really relevant for the crew. And uh, that's why I always try to know the props, to know what you can work with. Yeah. So it's a, it's very, uh, you've got to get along with the, the crew and understand the, the crew. But luckily, as you said, Ridley is well organized with the same crew for sometimes more than 40 years with the same crew. And so he knows those people really well and they will integrate you and you will understand who's who. Yeah. And I can imagine just producing a film. It's a huge 
there's a lot of momentum behind it, a lot of weight. They have to hit deadlines. They have limited access to props and costumes and all this stuff. They can create new stuff, but obviously they're on a budget, they're on a timetable. And so a historical advisor, just one part, you can't stop the train. And so you have to know how to kind of nudge the train or tell the train, oh no, actually it's quicker if you go this way or whatever. That's right, that's right. So, yeah. Very good image, that's uh, exactly it. Yeah, okay. So with that in mind, that's our kind of soft open for what's it like to be a historical advisor. We'll get into kind of the process for Napoleon here. So I had some questions to you. We went through this before, and so we'll review it with the audience now. So kind of what was the historical advising team for the Napoleon film? Uh, so we have some members here, but maybe you could talk through this real quick. So uh, at first, when I got the call um, for Ridley, uh, he said that uh, I would be with the team, but I didn't have the script back then. Um, but so I called a few uh, scholars, uh, friends of mine in France to organize the team. But then Ridley, when I had him on the phone again, he said, well, on set, it would just be you. So you, there won't be a team. Um, and I realized that also the production uh, designers uh, used Michael Brewers as a documentalist in pre-production, uh, is the specialist of Napoleon in England, is a uh, chair of Napoleonic Studies in Oxford, I think. Um, so, but he uh, never, he's never been on set. And we also have um, um, another, so we all separated. We're not uh, under the same command, commandments. We're just uh, sets of different advisors. The other one that could be linked to history, but he's mostly a military advisor, is Paul Bittis, a very, I think he's going to listen to this video, so I say hi, he's a very talented <laughs> man. And uh, so he organized uh, the boot camp in uh, pre-production and also during production. So he deals with x-ray, teach them stuff. Uh, yeah, he's, um, and, uh, and on set, it could be a good help for what people would shout or um, how people would react and is also linked to the stunt guys uh, with, uh, which is another complex, uh, another completely different uh, department, but is more linked to that. Uh, so with the stunt guys, they will see and the VFX guys, uh, like who is around a cannon. And so Paul Bittis will be there. Well, this is how you should act when you have a cannonball in your hand, don't act as if it's one pound heavy. So that's more his side of things. And me, <coughs> sorry, during pre-production, um, I, I was, um, so I was involved during the whole thing. Um, and so in pre-production, uh, on set, I was involved on set and then post and then promotion. Okay, and now we're gonna look at the workflow for the film. Uh, and just to explain it to audiences, you basics of you know film production, you have pre-production here, production, post-production and promotion. And then what I'm listing here in this kind of overall category is a description of generally what's happening in the film during those stages. And it can be particular to different directors and different films. But for this Napoleon movie, pre-production was getting organized, you know, creating the script, working on a storyboard and doing location shoots. Uh, on some other films, you had noted to me that the script sometimes isn't done until even post-production uh, on some movies. So it can it can vary uh, and things like that. But for Napoleon, this is the structure. And I guess, could you talk about your involvement in the pre-production phase? That's I already have some notes below, but maybe you could walk us through that. So during, during this time, I, um, so I gathered information in the sense that I had a year so I had to read books and I went straight to the original sources to get to know Napoleon better in his intimacy, to get to know Josephine better in her intimacy. I met all the, most of the French scholars uh, who are specialists on, all, who dedicated their life to studying the emperor. And of course we are the country with the most Napoleonic specialists. So that was a long time. And I also met all the, the some um, uh, curators of Napoleonic collections and also private Napoleonic collectors. And the production called me up during uh, pre-production 15 days before the shoot. And they said, well, 
Vanessa is coming to Paris, Vanessa Kirby. Uh, could you, um, you, you are Parisian, right? I said, no, I, I live in the countryside <laughs> in Burgundy. And they say, well, uh, in, uh, in two days, she's coming for three days. And uh, she wants to, and we want her to visit, and she would be really interested to dive into her role and to visit all the places Napoleonic in Paris, but it would be better if it's all privatized. So I had three days to call curators and all the, um, and sometimes um, we've got a monument called uh, the Army Museum, the Les Invalides, the Invalides, uh, which is also ruled by a general. And luckily through him, we managed to get uh, invited at seven o'clock in the morning and to have a private visit when the whole place was empty. We actually went all the way to the dome and have the greatest view in Paris. So she was really impressed about, about that. And I was really happy to provide a sort of VIP tour of Paris and also to get myself into those monuments alone. <laughs> that was a, such an experience. It was very impressive. We'll speak to how she prepped uh, herself in a uh, in Josephine section. But it was a uh, it was a uh, very privilege to get to spend three days with her uh, and three days with uh, Joaquin in Paris. And that's how we we sort of got along way better during the shoot because we knew each other. Um, so I got, I got very close to those actors and they were really information out of me very often to make their role more um, closer to the real Josephine, the real Napoleon. So okay. also then, when Ridley called me, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, I was just going to say, um, so to just quick keep, keep, us, keep us on time here. So for the pre-production then, gather information, speak to the actors, sometimes multi-day deep dives into understanding their character, touring locations, facilitating the learning process. Um, and then there is, I have here minor input on like the overall scope of the film. It's more so at this point related to the actors, maybe some input on sound and music. And then I think you were about to say Ridley reaches out and that's gonna be your minor input kind of in pre-production. That's right. And so he called me up and he said, um, well, um, in terms of music, um, I would like some style, and he said a bit oriental style of music for the movie. And I said, well, why don't you go full Corsican? And I gave him the contacts and the, and the music sample of Marcel Perez, the music we've got in the movie. And then that got sent to Martin Phillips, the, the um, composer, and that's who he picked. And so that group, two Corsican groups, um one that is also gregorian so the ensemble organum and spartimu they got uh they got to to record in london for the movie so i'm really happy that my advice got uh, listened and i think the the kyrie uh the the music we've got for austerlitz the kyrie mm -hmm. son really makes it uh makes it really good so i'm really happy about that okay and then as we shift into production afterwards, uh, I have notes here that the script hopefully gets finalized. They start shooting. Even some editing is done uh, during production. You told me that's kind of Ridley's style is to kind of edit as they go. Uh, and yeah. much of the CGI work is underway at this point. Um, so maybe you can touch on so now. So we do. We do. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. So yeah, that, uh, yeah, the editing and production. Uh, I didn't know that before working with Ridley, but some apparently do that and Ridley is quite impressive because we've got long days of shoot and at night he edits sometimes he pre-edits as he sees the movie uh, getting made and then read does it at night with the editors so it's a it's very massive amount of work for him uh, so me I don't do that of course I just on the day I'm here to deliver information so I've got on set morning, uh, I had a um, kind of a daily meeting with Joaquin Phoenix and uh, I had to, we were discussing uh, the script and sometimes if he had to add any input or want to say something a bit funny or a bit dramatic, uh, I would provide him quotes from Napoleon. Sometimes very hard to, to place into, into the movie because they are, you know, 18th century French, so when you translate it, it doesn't ring 
that well so you got to readapt it but that's was mostly his input and also um other things like you said minor input uh for example i had to um let's say to be a specialist of the flags because the flags they keep changing uh all the time through all different european countries and every time we've got a map and napoleon is talking about who is where you've got to place people based on the battle um that is represented on the map uh in the scene so um, a bit here uh, or sometimes objects uh, linked to napoleon so i would work with the prop department and so so that they provide the best objects for this or that scene and i think i had a note here some battle depictions is that just the flag or is it how the battle in general is portrayed as well for waterloo or for Austerlitz, i had a meeting on the day and they were like well can you tell us quickly what was going on and so even though everything was laid out every plan was done there are miniatures beautiful tables uh, representing the land and with miniatures and and things like that to help i guess the photography and everyone but they really uh, wanted as well my input to it and to give so for example for waterloo we we changed a few things from the script based on those uh, interviews to make it more understandable to the audience that the two armies are attacking and Napoleon decides to take the middle position, which was quite risky, but that he actually won Waterloo at first before the Ramforts came and he got betrayed by Grouchy, which we might have in the longer version. I don't want to say everything. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and we'll get we'll get into specifics of battles and all yes, that. Stuff yes, yes, that was a bit specific, but so we've covered now everything up through production. Just to keep us going, let's cover post-production and promotion. Um, post-production, this is where they have all their raw content. They're doing CGI work on top of it, editing as a wider team, voiceover, sound effects, music, and then promotion is all about the marketing, interviews, events, and things like that. So just real quickly, maybe in a minute or two, could it give us your involvement on this tail end of, uh, of the movie cycle? So I got invited, uh, so Ridley edits at his place in the south of France. So I got invited, it's not too far from my place. So I got invited there for three days um to uh, with the editors to check and to help out with the voiceovers to check also that if there were any misspelling so for example there was a little one where instead of saying it was in french so it was saying madame de remusa it was saying madame de Rezamu or something like that so they managed to change that in the uh, in uh, post-production because i yeah. spotted it and so I helped out as well in for writing the voiceovers because the voiceovers are based on uh, letters that I exchanged between Napoleon and Josephine. So it was based on historical sources. And uh, during promotion, I had a meeting with uh, I had a meeting with uh, Ridley a couple of times on the phone and and uh, with uh, uh, Joaquin as well um also to catch up <laughs> but also to uh speak about the um, how complex the character is and how to present him to our modern times and to um to find ways to introduce the character in the work that was done so that was okay. uh, that was it okay yeah and i see we have a budget for about 20 minutes so we're going a little bit over so i'm going to try and go through this fairly quickly um so the, the other portion of this kind of historical advisor block here is, you know, what does a typical day look like and what's your level of influence? So maybe a typical day, if we could just do that really quickly in like 30 seconds to a minute, just give people a sense of you wake up and then what happens broadly before you go okay. to sleep again on the same day. Okay, so I wake up, I've got, um, so the shooting was in England, so I wake up in London uh, sometimes you had to drive up to an hour. You arrive there, um, have a yeah, text, uh, Joaquin's assistant, uh, to check if he wants a meeting or not. Or sometimes, as soon as I drive there, I um, I get the message. We meet. Uh, we have a meeting. That is, if he wants to, um, between 
seven and eight or between eight and nine and then at nine i have uh, the crew call so i have to be on set by nine sometimes eight depending on the day you arrive on set then there's ridley that is there so i'm closer to ridley uh in case he's got any question um and then i've got my radio on and i just wait for the question to be asked or as soon as there's a scene, or sometimes during the morning is the most important time because you get all the questions for the day. And before each scene, Ridley comes out of his trailer and you've got uh, a meeting for each scene. So sometimes we do four, five a day. It goes very quick because it's got four camera. So that's up to, it goes for 10 hours. And then I drive home as easy as that. Okay. Uh, and then here, what is your level of influence? We had a bunch of community questions. They're kind of grouped together. We'll try and hit them real quick. Uh, Joey's channel says, did they listen to him, meaning yourself, or has, I think he said, he not looked at the history himself? So I think just to answer it for you, yes, you've looked at the history. You had almost a year to research for yourself, talk to all the experts, um, create a vast web of, of expertise here. Uh, did they listen to him? I'll let you maybe summarize that. I think we've already talked about your level of influence, but go ahead and kind of maybe if you want to recap it. So I think you will see uh, the in later the in in a, you, I think that question will be answered later because sometimes I get very listened to the point that, uh, for example, the coronation scene, um, you have to do the whole thing to even things that is not even shot. Uh, and so, yes, they listen to me because there's no one else to listen to. Uh, but sometimes, no, they don't listen or they do their own thing. And they don't have to listen to me because it's a visual, uh, fictional, uh, historical-based uh, movie. But they, the director, just like a painter, if he wants to paint a spaceship in the middle of a, <laughs> of a painting, uh, for, he will do it. So... He does what he wants, so that's it. Okay, and then the next question here is uh, maybe a question or two related to Ridley Scott's relationship with the historical advisors and how much was he involved in the history himself? So uh, Ridley's a history buff. As a, as a, he really knows history very well. So sometimes we have conversation um, just about general history, something that's got nothing to do with um the 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 movie we're shooting uh, we can speak about the vikings or we speak about a lot about the crusades a lot about um richard hallofly and he's very really passionate about all this about henry the eighth he actually had a castle uh henry the eighth personal castle at one point in his life um so i have a very good relationship with him in the sense that been invited to his place and everything um so he offered me a christmas present <laughs> so i got i guess is a uh, is uh we got a good relationship and he he likes what i can give and i understand that sometimes he would just say no and i get on with it i just i don't i'm not too upset about um historical um adaptations you'll make to real history i'm gonna say <laughs> okay and a related question you say he's a history buff this person asks what books were used to make the script i, I doubt you can answer that <laughs> and even if you could like say ridley read these books there's a whole kind of process so um yeah i don't know i don't know which books he used um I, I, and it's not ridley who wrote the the script it's uh david scarper I don't know That's which right. books he used, and um, I'm uh, I'm definitely sure by reading the script that he read uh, Remusat, Madame de Remusat. Pretty sure about that. Um, otherwise, I don't know. And uh, most of the books he would have read would be in English. I've mostly read French books on Napoleon, so I wouldn't know which books it was. Understood. Uh, but let's see. but if I can, if there if I can advise, if I can advise a book, I think it's translated in English. It's from Louis Chardini. Louis Chardini. It's called L'homme Napoléon. Napoleon the man. And this is a very good to know Napoleon's intimacy. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, and then we'll try and keep going here. Next one says, what was one thing he, you, meaning Loris, uh, that got suggested and implemented? And what's one thing that did not get implemented? I think, well, um, a lot got implemented in terms of flags, uh, for example, the, the, the flag of Elba. It's mostly details that I add, but I can't change a whole thing that has been prepped for months and that they really want to do but i could help with uh, some stuff i've also made suggestions in pre-production on certain scenes that really didn't um could not be historically adapted i can't really speak much about it but scenes that were not shot in the end so that's a very good point on my side of things but also um a lot of things linked to Napoleon's personal behavior. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so it's mostly details, but that's what makes depth in a movie. OK. Uh, and then KSM 1197 asks, uh, what is the craziest idea that the director wanted to implement? Well, I think we'll speak about the the cannons <laughs> on the pyramid. Is that That's crazy enough. Yeah. OK. Uh, and then. Uh, this next individual asks, what about the extras? Where are they from? Who equips them, drills them? And is it historically focused or is cinematography more important? Uh, I'll speak to this real quick in the sense that I know that we had worked with the 21st Infanterie de Lille, which is a UK-based French reenactment group. And I know they were involved somewhat in pre-production, helping to kind of train people and get them used to things. But I don't think they were featured in the film itself. Um, so maybe in like 30 seconds, can you speak to the extras? So yes, the the extras they are um, they are from the place where we shoot. So for example, in Malta, they are from Malta. Except for the the stuntmen who travel with the crew. Uh, otherwise, they're equipped and uh, in terms of clothes by the prop houses who are uh, the clothes in there are rented by the the team of Janty, the costume designer, Janty Yates, uh, who's actually. Uh, nominated for the Oscars on that movie. And uh, in terms of weapons, there's an armorer that is on, the, on here who rents from prop houses or has got his own stuff and drills them. Uh, it's mostly, it's both yeah, history and cinema, cinematographic uh, focus, but cinematographic is more important. Okay. Cool. Well, that recaps our historical advisor portion. We're a little bit over budget on time, but that's fine. I think it's really useful to get this kind of insight into the industry, into your role, into the development of the film before we even get to the specifics, because then it helps people understand why or why not things might have happened. To me, the biggest takeaway for understanding kind of your involvement in the film is one, you had it like a year of time to prep, reading primary sources, talking to experts, getting a lot of information. That's, you know, if anyone from the audience would want someone to do something for the film, it would be to do that. So I think that checks the box. Great. Um, I, but then the I second did. thing to conclude. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I would say that's, I, that's great to confirm that, obviously. But then the I second did point. Between five and six hours of reading a day on Napoleon. That was yeah. just insane. Just like an exam, though. You're really good on the day. And then a couple of months <laughs> later, you... It all flies away, uh, but uh, it's uh, it's it was impressive how how much um, how much work uh, got involved and how much how much how many sources were available on Napoleon. That was really yeah. good. So I'll say that's my main takeaway from this historical advisor portion is the historical advisor um, got a lot of information, basically as much as general audience would probably hope that a historical advisor would would want on the script. Um, but then this, or sorry, on the topic. And then the second portion is what I'm learning is your level of influence is not that great in the sense that the film production is a huge, like I said, like a moving train. It's very hard to change the direction of things. By the time you're asked to get involved, a lot of things are already in motion. There's limitations after that on, you know, time, budget, available uh, equipment you know, a director's vision for how things should be depicted. And really, there's not too much that you can move or change by the time you get called upon. Um, the only way to fix that would be historical advisors embedded with almost every team 
and then it would double or triple the amount of time to develop the film probably. And then, so there's, yeah, the moving train concept is just a, a big one for people to understand. True. Um, but but, but yeah. you can work on details and we can see that. And with Joaquin, we got really involved on every detail and major characteristic of Napoleon. Let's jump into that. Let's jump okay. into Napoleon. Yeah, so then now we'll, we'll transition to the major characters portions. We have Napoleon, his marshals, and then Josephine. Uh, we'll start with Napoleon. So the way we have this broken up is there's a section at the top of each of these areas that says movie. So we'll talk about how the movie depicted something. We'll talk history, and then we'll talk uh, behind the scenes. So I'll zoom in here on our notes for the movie. So just kind of my reading of the film and kind of general audiences is you see Napoleon a lot of times directly involved in combat, either charging into combat or um, directing troops and cannons to fire more so as like an active participant in the battles than grand strategy tent several miles behind getting orders, doing tactical stuff. It's more, or sorry, strategic stuff. It was more very involved uh, depiction. So that was one thing to note. Um, the Napoleon portrayal himself, you may quibble about this, but the general vibe online is that he was uncharismatic. Um, I did see in the film that it seemed like a lot of times, especially early on, he was, you know, falling asleep or stumbling into <coughs> situations. And what it looked like, at least from my perspective, is major events in Napoleon's life were out of his control <coughs> and he kind of stumbled into them. Uh, I think like the coup scenes are a good example, things like that. Uh, and then I pulled a quote from the movie that made me laugh, where he says, literally, I am not ambitious. It might have been a joke, but it just... It is a joke. That. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it kind of plays off of maybe the audience is, is getting some of that. So Napoleon has a little bit of tongue-in-cheek in the film. Nonetheless, I would still characterize him as relatively uncharismatic or, or bumbling. Uh, and then another big portion is the obsession with Josephine and their relationship being a big driver for the film so less a biopic more about kind of their relationship um that's my take on it it's a little bit of the audience's take as i've seen online for blogs or reddit or things like that um you know you're here obviously with more knowledge on how the film was created but this is kind of just me reflecting back maybe what people are thinking about um what the movie effectively portrayed um but i'll let you comment on this before we move on to maybe the, the actual history yeah, but the, the thing, there are two histories. There is me. I am the, when I'm on set, I have to be the safeguard of the general history, the one with the big H. But then you're when you're on set, you have to defend the history with a tiny H, the, the story. In English, you've got actually the story. And so the story here is has to be, in, even though I am, here to defend history, you have to, to work for the story. So when it's said that Napoleon is charging when he was not supposed to, well, it makes him look epic. When he is directly involved in combat, that makes him, um, you understand more, you relate more why his troops would have loved him. And so you, the fact that he, he falls asleep is to it's a sort of improv it's an improvised improvisation joke to show that Napoleon did not care about those poor strategic political schemes, but he wanted to get the job done. Yes, it is very stereotypical of him, who knew all the networks and who was really involved into politics in his uh, young years, but it also shows a face of Napoleon. And I think that's what this, a lot of people criticize this movie for having multiple faces. Napoleon has different, even we could say masks. He's got different, he's sometimes the guy that is bored, the guy that is obsessed with Josephine, the guy that is a fighter, he's falling asleep, he's the politician, he's ambitious, he's greedy. So, but that's all those faces are a sort of puzzle of Napoleon's face, which is impossible to recreate. Just like every time there's a new biography of Napoleon, it will focuses on different insights of the personality. And Joaquin really wanted to not to choose. So the audience 
would have different perspective and um and never spoon feed the information that's why when he says i'm not ambitious it's sort of a joke like there were even jokes that were because he got so into his role that's a little behind the scenes that i don't think uh, I, it's i know nobody it's just a thing they said to me so nobody's ever heard that uh it's before coronation he says to me i say okay you're so we during the day we discuss that napoleon according to witnesses looked actually green because he was so he felt like the weight of the years was heavy on his shoulders and the the fact that he would create a new dynasty it's a big thing for him it's a big thing for his life of course coronation and and when we i just went to him just before he walked down the aisle and the nave uh i was like yeah any question or something like that are you good and uh, he said i'm doing all this for the people <laughs> <laughs> and like it's such it's I, napoleon of course never said that and and he i'm not even sure he had his mic on but it's it's very funny it's a funny thing you know and so napoleon was a very funny character and there's also yes napoleon was amb ambitious but there was also that funny part to it i think he he got that quite well and the obsession with josephine it, it is a huge part of uh napoleon's psyche uh if you read his letters it is shocking even to a modern man <laughs> it is shocking that he would call um names napoleon uh josephine's private parts and he would say i kiss uh, that and that and so it's very very um uh, very intense and so you uh, what he showed in the movie no one was behind closed doors but i think he could have been even wilder in real life uh according to even some scholars in france we've got a scholar specialized in uh sex in the uh, 18 in the imperial court and he said it could have been even uh even more intense strangely enough yeah and i i like that that portion the obsession was included in the film it just did feel like at times it overrode some of the historical parts mm. like things that stand out obviously is he leaves egypt because um as the yeah, movie but... frames it she's cheating on him as opposed to yeah. any strategic reasons same thing when I think he returns from exile. It's almost because they put it right after a scene where she's dancing with the czar and maybe is mm. again threatening to cheat on him. So there's like, it, it seems like it went a little bit too far in, in those areas to override some some places where maybe talking about the strategy overall is is sacrificed for this this story beat. Mm. Um, but the the relationship with Josephine, according to the very first script, was the and it still is. Uh, the the directing line of the movie so that's why sometimes the it is very um em emphasis there's a lot of um, focus on this yeah and let's let's move to these portions down here because this is relevant so we have in the history section here you kind of touched on this napoleon has many faces you know here you highlighted right. uh which aspects the film does focus on which one it doesn't We'll quickly go there, and then there's a little bit down here in the behind the scenes section about um, changing focus of the film, kind of the, the through line that they wanted. So we'll get to there. But maybe um, can you wrap up this section here on the the different um, what yes. is in the film, so, what's not? So in in the movie, uh, the movie ticks a lot of um, it can't tick everything. Uh, so you can see that napoleon is looking for peace every time he's got discussions is uh, napoleon always uh, in a way wanted peace but then he realized that the best way to maintain his country was through war but war was always for peace there's a very good book called napoleon the art of war or i don't know the title in english so it's a collection of every piece written by napoleon based on war and his Im impression and his philos philosophical idea on war was peace so it could be quite strange for the modern audience but in the movie uh, strangely enough manages to show that napoleon was looking for peace and it's other country that declared war against him 
Napoleon officially never declared any war except the one in Spain, uh, but always, of course, he pushed for wars to to happen. Uh, so the movie, you kind of see that, and you also see the epicness of the last fighting king. A lot of people came to me, even during the shoot, and they were like, well, we know Napoleon was not on his, on his horse back, uh, yielding his saber and killing enemies at this battle. What do you think of it? And I was like, this is great, you know, because you have to show in the story, even though it's not in the history, first, Napoleon historically has yelled the sword and has been involved in these younger years, personally involved into fight. But you have to show that he is, and in fact, it's true, the last fighting kings, fighting kings. All the kings were old at this time and fat. Not all of them were fat, but it's also the image in the caricatures of the time. But they were definitely old. Is half the age of all of them, something which we can't really see in the movie because the actor is quite old himself for the, for the, the, the character he represents. Uh, but you see him fighting and involved. What you don't have in the movie is, as you said, you pointed out, you don't have the tactician. You, we don't really have the knowledge of what is going on and how Austerlitz is such a good tactical move. Uh, you don't have the math buff. So Napoleon, for example, it's a funny anecdote, would wake up at night and we actually got a record of this. He wrote down all the amount uh, for his household, all the amount of sugars, all these staff members were adding into their coffee and if they reduced the sugars, how much money you would save. So Napoleon wrote that at 2 a.m. He woke up to write that down and to to make, to make save money from his household because he was like, that is the money of the French. So you don't have that addiction to mathematics. Also, you know, Napoleon, in the movie, we've got a scene that was cut where they speak a bit about the um, about the bed napoleon's got a folding bed and he actually invented his folding bed you could see it in the army museum in paris you, it existed before the folding bed but it was separated in lots of different pieces but he, he designed a bed that could fold and open very quickly and it's all in one piece because he was an engineer he also invented uh is he was a handyman he was an inventor he invented furniture that was very blunt for the time very so all that you don't have in the movie and the fact that the link between that bed and his military school is that because for years when he learned how to become a soldier he was actually locked up in a three meter square room he was locked up from the outside in that tiny bed so that's the bed he would sleep the best on was that tiny folding bed that he had on a campaign all the time with him, which he invented. You don't have in the movie how much he would lie to people and he would lie through his propaganda to his men. And you also have, like, you also don't have a part of his personality. That is the fact that Napoleon smoked a lot or that he would fidget with objects. He had uh, an armchair. So it's a known anecdote, but he had a knife always on him. And when people would speak to him, he would destroy the arm of the armchair. And every day, these staff members would have to re-sew it. It's very cinematic things, but that were not done in the movie. He can't do everything. But that that sort of, this material could be used for something else. So it's interesting to see what a movie would focus on and not focus on. And you have to have to know all this all this stuff around that will never be used but could be used at some point so that's why you have to know yeah and and to to think about this so you have a big list of everything that you could portray for napoleon you can't do all of them you select some of them the decision to choose what is in or out comes from the general direction of the film obviously if you want to tell a particular story you're going to try and focus on some things versus other things so um, if I were making the film and a lot of people online from my community, we're all military history, you know, armchair generals. We come from video games. We like watching war films and stuff. If we were to do it, 
we would obviously focus on the tactician, military school, things like that. That's, I think, what people were hoping. Um, part of it be, is because just it, it, it looks cool. We like military history. Another part of it is it's, it's a big part of Napoleon's story. But then the third part of it, particular for me, is um, you have the budget of Hollywood. It would be great to see that translated into the portrayal of really good tactics and cool battles like Alexander the Great, the movie. Um, pretty good movie, but just the battle sequences are unparalleled. So I think that's what people are really hoping for to get out of history uh, based movies. And unfortunately, this film had some of the spectacle, but didn't necessarily really translate that into the focus of the story. So the, the tactics being very well portrayed wasn't the, the focus. So maybe we can move on down here, which is, well, what was the vision from Ridley? Um, why did they choose to focus on certain things and not other things? So you have some notes here that said, first, they were thinking about having the through line be uh, Napoleon as the tyrant, but then later they switched to it being more complex. So maybe you can talk about Ridley's vision and then quickly Joaquin Phoenix's vision for uh, the Napoleon character. Yeah. I'm just putting it out there that I don't want to, I'm not into their mind. So I just have, I don't exactly know their vision, but I know what they originally wanted from discussions. Uh, so it's true that at first you could feel it's more of a feeling than an, an absolute truth uh, that there was that more tyrant focus aspects on Napoleon being quite brutal or war. You know, the, the British called for a century for a century Napoleon the god of war, even though they were their worst enemy. So there there was that sort of aura aura around uh, the the character at first and then uh, Joaquin came in and really wanted to um, when we visited Paris together he, he asked me well, why is it that men really truly loved him why was he so social why was he so loved in Paris you know Napoleon made the fountain public when during French Revolution you had to pay for water so to make it free and make it clean. He really cleaned the city. So he was loved in Paris uh, by his population in a way. And why was he so loved by and admired by his men? He can't only be propaganda. So all those questions went um, for Joaquin. He really wanted to add that social bit. And uh, and it's true because it's not, Napoleon is uh, it's not black and white character. It's very nuanced. And so and then Ridley and Joaquin had discussions. I was sometimes involved, and uh, we turned into that more complex character. And uh, and Ridley definitely wanted to make a character. Napoleon has been done. That's an interesting fact. There is a hundred and seven movies on Napoleon. One hundred and seven movies. There is a thousand people. In the, the there's a guy that did this thesis on Napoleon and the cinema, so it's recent uh, research. A thousand people have played Napoleon in the movies, in the movie industry since the beginning. A thousand people. So when you're a director as experienced as Ridley, you don't want to do something uh, that was already done. And some historians they say, well, to do Napoleon, you just have to wear the bicorn, so Napoleon's hat, and to put your hand like this in the writing coat and you are Napoleon. Well, you can guess that nobody really wants to do that. It would be as relevant as shooting or making a movie about a statue. So the modern cinema really wants to go into the in-depth, to, into the doubts, into the intimacy of a character. So there was really that, that wish uh, from both. Okay. Cool, and I'm going to keep us on a time budget. I'd love to talk more about Napoleon as a character. Um, maybe we'll be able to do a follow-up, but for now we'll have to move on. Um, big portion of a character, characters here is Napoleon's marshals. This is budgeted for five minutes. The main point is that um, in the film, I did look up on IMDb who's in uh, the film. Uh, so there are a couple of the marshals. There's... Um, uh, some generals and other forces. Uh, here you can see them labeled. Um, yeah, you have them in a couple scenes. But it does speak to the fact that I had to go to IMDb to see who's even in the film to recognize that they didn't really have a big part in the movie. Um, so that's the main thing to point out here. You do see a couple of them. There's maybe three or four. 
Um, historically, there's a whole cadre of um, marshals, and they're all really important in Napoleon's story, all charismatic, charismatic, colorful characters, huge impact on Napoleon's success. So there's a little bit of a, of a deficiency there in the film. And then one thing I did want to point out is some of the portrayals of the characters when they were included, uh, Marshal Ney here, for instance, famously, you know, fiery appearance, and then they completely changed his appearance, black hair, big like mutton chops and all that. So I think I'm seeing a lot of this online is where are all of his, you know, marshals and then the ones that are included, why are they so different than history? So that's just kind of the framing. And then maybe can you give us some behind the scenes on on the decision there? Well, the the thing is, it's a movie on Napoleon, not so much Napoleon's marshals, and they quite often involve around the table. There are some scenes that have been cut, uh, especially with Colin Corso, played by Ben Millis, very good actor, by the way, who um, who does the return of Egypt, the return, sorry, of Russia, and who actually wrote um, the return of Russia on a slave with the emperor. It's a very good book on uh, on the insight of uh, Napoleon's discussions. So that's one of the move. What's that's one of, of the book that I know for sure was involved by the writer. By the way, um, the what's interesting is that the each actors really wanted really them to stand out. So that's why they all had different specific types of hair or size or things like this or age, and uh, the so that's how you they represented the colorfulness and also the the. Um, costume work is really accurately done so the costume work is stunning for the marshals yeah uh, i did want to introduce yeah. just one relevant um part here so i found online uh i believe it's john hollingworth who played marshall nay and he just did a little bit of a an interview so the portrayal of his character i just wanted to insert this here because it's it's relevant so it sounds like basically he showed a picture to ridley on his ipad quoting the article saying hey this is what my character looks like and it looks like Ridley says, according to this quote, he just drew all over uh, the actor's face a big beard and said, hey, give him this. So it's, I don't know, it's, I understand it being unique, but it seems like there's kind of like a, oh, it doesn't matter what he looks like um, here. Yeah, that's, uh, I wasn't there, but it's, it's the kind <laughs> of thing you would do for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, what's um, interesting is that, yes, the, what what I uh, some uh, behind the scenes stuff? I um I got really close to in discussion with uh, Scott Handy, for example, who plays Berthier, um, and and they have worked so much on their own character because they were really happy to be involved in such project. So I think maybe they were a bit sad not to have uh, so many lines, but they knew about it and. Um, but that was impressive that even though they didn't really um, have that many lines, but between them, sometimes I was involved in conversation and they were saying, oh, my character did that. And they were having historical discussions on set while they were dressed up as their characters. And I was just as if I was among the marshals uh, discussing all their previous uh, battles. So that was quite quite a thing, uh, quite an experience for me. And really interesting how, even though they didn't have many lines, how each of them really worked their characters and how they read books about them. That was impressive. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I understand. We'll move on. I, you know, obviously people watching on wish that they were a bigger part, that they were somehow the focus, that they were given more uh, space to breathe. Unfortunately, you got chopped, and maybe that's in service of the greater story being on Napoleon, his romance, things like that, not so much the tactical. If you were to redo the film with the tactical focus, I would hope that the you know all the, the marshals and the generals would, would play a bigger role, but we talked about the, the choice of direction there. And um, there is the director's cut. Yes. And I can't say much, but it's... <laughs> got it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we'll have to speed through this pretty quickly, but maybe we can talk uh, real briefly on Josephine. Um, so you have some notes here on what the movie got right, what the movie got wrong. So maybe are you able to, to just give us a quick one to two minute overview here? And I'm going to have to be strict on time because we got to keep going. Yes. Yes. Um, 
so um, Josephine, <clears throat> she is well portrayed in the movie because we've got, uh, I really liked, I said to you early on that we did three days with uh, Vanessa and she really wanted, that's how deep she went for a character. She wanted to go to the Malmaison, so Josephine and Napoleon's private house outside Paris and um, where Josephine had a rose garden and had uh, animals, white animals and everything. Over there, this place is a shrine of Napoleonic history. And I know the curator well. We went there when it was closed down. And Josephine, uh, sorry, that's interesting. Vanessa really wanted to hear the, the floor cracking and the ticking of the bells and everything to get more into the sound and spiritual environment of uh, Josephine. And then together we went on a, she really wanted to go and see her. So we went on the tomb of Josephine and there, there is a sort of a, a big monument in the Rue Elma Maison next to Paris in the, the church. And she really wanted to take a time alone with Josephine herself. I found that really impressive and she really worked her character really well. She really studied. So we had big historical discussions, but she already read a lot on her character. So what the movie got right was the teeth. You know, Josephine had bad teeth from, we say from sucking because she comes from Martinique. So from sucking um, sugar cane. So she had bad teeth. So every time she would smile, she would put a little, a little uh, something in front of her mouth or put her hand. She had a lot of mannerism and she was very involved in that passionate, intimate relationship with, um, with Napoleon. So we also have the jail and the impact. We didn't visit the jail with, um, with Vanessa, but the jail part is a place, a very secret place uh, to visit in Paris. I'm not even sure it's open to public, but on the wall to show you how impressive that might have, that must have been for Josephine, on the wall where she was in prison, there were sabers that were hung on the wall. And because those sabers were used for execution, they were not, because the, the guillotine was not used that much, they were always replaced in next to the cell where she was. And so you still have the red marks of the blood on the wall where the sabers were. It's called mm -hmm. now the room of the sabers. So your, the jail part and the, the influence on the jail on our relationship and a, a, a thrive to survive, you got that right in the movie. So that was very good. The struggle for infertility. So, and the fact that they, she sacrificed and Napoleon was heartbroken from that sacrifice with Josephine. And, and then their relationship became much colder through time. As in the movie, it's depicted as still um, intense, but the, the writing, we can read that Napoleon is much more colder in his letters. The gaming, it got right. So that's where sometimes I, I get really involved in the games, which games, how to play a game. Uh, all the gaming scenes I have to set up, for example, an 18th century game that is called the Pharaoh. So you see, that's where the, the historical advisor could be involved. Uh, what would she drink? Uh, she would drink rum. So every time she's got a little drink, it's uh, a little uh, drink that looks like rum. The dog as well. <laughs> I wrote down the dog is also good in the movie. It's the it's the right color uh, of her dog, which she was really fond of. And uh, in the the uh, biograph of um, Josephine Pierre Branda, who I worked with and who I, um, I read his works, all his works, and he, he liked the depiction of Josephine in the movie. So that I think uh, is quite pleasant to read. Of course, the movie makes mistakes. For example, uh, when the kid calls his mother Josephine, when her name is Marie-Rose Tachère de la Pagerie. Uh, and so, but it's to make it understandable to the audience, it's actually, Napoleon that renames Josephine, Josephine. He changes her name, just like Jesus would. He just changes people's names. He would do that quite often. So it's a sort of, I think it's a sort of thing when you do, when you're high power, <laughs> you to change people's name. Um, and uh, we, 
for example, in the movie, there's a an invitation letter, and it was written, Josephine invites you to the bowl. And we changed that. And I was like, well, her name was Marie-Rose. And they were like, well, we never mentioned that her name was Marie-Rose, so you can't say that. I said, well, we could say Citizen Beauharnais, or something like that. And so that's what we did. But then we didn't change the line. So the kid says Josephine and gives out the paper which says uh, Citizen Beauharnais. So you see, it's very complex because you have to work out, yes, with history, but it has to be understandable for the audience. What yes, the movie then, doesn't get. Yes, sir. No, I was going to say, just to, to keep us moving, The maybe the last major point I think you were going to get to is she's very sly. There's evidence of her doing forgeries, stealing from soldiers, getting up to a lot of schemes and things like that. Um, so yes. I'll let you wrap up, but we'll have to go move on in like 30 seconds. Yeah, so it's a complex story, but she was involved in a, in a state uh, stealing uh, business. She actually... Uh, did forgery of uh, documents and stole money from the food that that money would belong to the food of the soldiers. It's not really known story, but it's a major, major uh, troubling story where the the wife of the future of uh, the consul at the time stole uh, money instead of feeding the soldiers. She used it for real estate investment for her own under her own name. So that was terrible. Something that Napoleon would not have done because Napoleon was really taking care of uh, giving the money back to the people. So that was very sly, and you don't have that in the movie. In the movie, she's very portrayed as a as a, not a saint, but a, sort of a, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how you say that. But a good person. Got it. Okay, we have a big portion here, which is going to be the major battles, a section on Waterloo. Um, we're going to try and wrap this up in about you know, 20, 30 minutes. There's a ton we could get into here, um, but we're going to have to go through it fairly quickly, and hopefully we can just kind of hit the highlights. So we'll go for Battle of the Pyramids first. So one of the major takeaways from this is a lot of these battles move really quickly. You don't really get to see the battle itself. The uh, opposing forces, I think there was critique online that people were saying they looked at least at a distance to be mostly mounted, or sorry, dismounted versus you should see a lot of cavalry. But the more uh, important part is at some point you have uh, the cannons just shoot at the pyramids. Uh, that's the major thing I think to say about this sequence. The history here I have basically is, you know, there is a bigger map. They're not right in front of the pyramids. That's maybe allowable. Maybe people would have hoped that some of the nuances of the cavalry and the squares and all that stuff was better depicted. Whatever, that's been shortened. The main thing maybe we can talk about here is the decision to, to shoot the pyramids <laughs> before we move on. So yes, in real, in real life, it was two kilometers away, but the, the movie really wants to establish at this moment, Napoleon as an artillery guy. And so what is what makes me sad is that I am, also very involved in Egyptology and Napoleon actually created Egyptology through this ex to this ex expedition. So Napoleon is the creator of this field of preserving the treasures of ancient times and you see him shooting the pyramids. So me, it was really painful uh, to be part of this. But you understand the burlesque, the absurdity of this scene uh, in the sense that it's there's a funny take on it that the Mamluk guy is very powerful. He's got his all army lineup. They're shouting uh, Salmat el Saladin, which means death to the Crusaders. This is, I added the line there. So I was pretty happy with that. You're always happy when you manage to get something <laughs> in. It's very, I don't know, perhaps prideful, but you get quite happy to, to do that. And anyway, so what they shout is death to the Crusaders, which is an accurate shout that they would do back then, that the Mamluks would have shouted to the French army. And so we actually trained the whole um, stuntmen and uh, and extras to shout that in uh, in Arabic. If you know the history of Malta and we are shouting in Maltese, this is quite ironic <laughs> that Maltese people are shouting that. Uh, anyway. Um, what is uh, 
interesting is to show the what really really wanted is that people talked about it i guess and guess what yesterday two days ago i was invited in the sorbonne university and to speak about the movie and to speak about napoleon in the movie world and i gave out a conference and a famous french scholar stopped me and asked the question he said well what i saw in this scene is september um the 11th of september 2001 i was like i never thought of that i don't think anybody thought of that i don't know. have you thought of that i don't know but i it was really you know to everyone would have taken a different inf information i find it quite funny that he just without a move boom bangs the cannon the guy falls on the floor is dead or is taken away and then we wrap up and we've understood that napoleon really wants to be the new alexander the great the new caesar and he comes back home with an ideal of uh imperialism so that's that's my take on it uh i don't think it looks like terrorism of september 11. i um i understand the absurdity or burlesque part of this scene but if it was my movie i would not have done it yeah and, and like you said to your point it's unfortunate that he did it more so to be to be different maybe to make a statement about napoleon's character even though it runs in contradiction of the tactics of the battle the his role as a you know passionate founder of egyptology all that stuff um it sucks that it got condensed in the way that it did um yeah but, it's not my favorite scene i've got to say uh well we'll have some more <laughs> the other <laughs> the other battle is uh is austerlitz so this one just to frame it in mind for people who might not have seen the movie basically um it gets boiled down to kind of this depiction that i'm showing in the image essentially you have the french encamped in the middle of this kind of frozen area the uh, enemy coalition comes in the french signal that they're coming that's fine they're going to attack the french position but then overlooking them from up high are the secret reserves of the french who then sweep down and you know they, they take out the enemy i have some kind of uh CG, early cgi renders that i found online from the sfx team uh or for a vfx team um, that shows a little bit more clearly what's being depicted in the film and then eventually this surprise assault breaks the army and they flee out and they get cannonballed over the ice. That's the depiction um, in the movie. Obviously it's wildly different from Austerlitz. It seems like they condense Austerlitz down to just this one segment of the battle, which is where uh, the Russians famously, I think, uh, retreat. And maybe there's a little bit apocryphal tale, I believe about cannonballs breaking the ice, but it was never really an intentional strategy, nor the crux of the battle. The, crux of the battle more so is about Napoleon kind of baiting the enemy, moving them into position on the heights, using the fog then to storm that later on, and then using reinforcements coming in from the south to sandwich the enemy, break through the center, clash of the Imperial Guards. There's like so much to this battle that I wish somehow was included, but just stating it, it's a big dilemma for how do you turn that into something that general audiences can understand. Maybe I wish this battle had been depicted on a map or found some way to depict really the nuance of it. Um, but obviously the, the decision was made to, to package it down into something simple, understandable. And I think you were telling me one of the major things is have each battle look and feel really distinct from one another so they stand out. So I'll let you maybe take it from here on, on how Austerlitz came to be. And each battle also stands out in the history of cinema so you've got to understand that a director wants to uh in, in inscribes himself wants to stand out among all the the battles that have been done in the past and so many people did um like if you watch uh, the movies uh, in the in the the 70s about napoleon and you can see much clearer which army advancing that has been done way better in the past, so Nap uh, Ridley did not want to do anything like this. And he wanted, he said to me at first, he said, we're not doing Austerlitz, we're doing Austerlitz by Ridley Scott. So it's a, he himself, he says that. So I, I knew where I was going. But uh, strangely enough, historically, so there's been research in that like three people were died in there, three, 
and a couple of horses because there's only 50 centimeters of height of water in real life. But what is not really known, even by historians, and yesterday I told you with the Sorbonne, we got having a sort of uh, specialist discussion on that. Very interesting. Napoleon writes the on the day, the second day of uh, the battle, he writes the, the, the sum up of what happened. And 12 hours later, he actually corrects it and invents the lake story. So when the lake story, and he says in that in that document, which has been sent to Napoleon's army, he says that 10,000 people died in the lake. So it's, it's we can say, yes, it is apocrypha, but it's actually done uh, by, it's Napoleon propaganda. And through French books, uh, it was it was common to repeat the famous uh, Les Etangs de Pradzen. I don't know, uh, the Pradzen, uh, the, the uh, plateau, sorry, the uh, Pradzen and the, the lake and um, the station. And so anyway, what is interesting is that here, what we're depicting is Napoleon propaganda. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which uh, was done, which doesn't represent the battle, but what it's what Napoleon sent to his men on the second day when he changed the story himself. So we are, we are showing a myth here. And what's very interesting is um, if you take attention to what Joaquin is saying when he's staying on top, he said, let him think they've got the higher ground, or he, he explains the disposition. What he says is what we work together, and it's based on the real movements of who's doing what in Austerlitz. But we are shooting this in uh, Bourne Woods. That's where Ridley shot is. Um, that's where Ridley shot Gladiator, and uh, so that was really impressive to be back. And I had a very interesting story because the guys who do the snow business will put the snow everywhere. It was. It was raining the day before the shoot. So the actors of set that they had to put fake snow on, they had to redo it just a couple of hours. So it was very stressful for those guys. And it's truly, it looks like um, the inside when the, where the battle in real life is on a, is on a flat higher ground and the, the enemies are on the higher ground. So here the disposition of the battle, nothing is accurate and especially not the discovery of the cannons but you have to work with that and try to make it more accurate through the speeches that's where i got more involved or through um what people would shout or through things like this um so and the disposition of who's doing what where you've got it's a beautiful shot when you've got napoleon standing here with his with his uh in long view with his uh how do you call that in English? Uh, a spyglass. The spyglass, thank you. Is uh, is looking the battle through spyglass, and behind him, you've got uh, the his old guard standing. It's a beautiful, very cinematic shot, and um, and uh, the the photographer uh, Aidan Monaghan, there is a, a friend, did a really good job of picturing this in uh, understanding that. Ridley works like a painter and he wants to take things from a painting. So this image is actually from a painting. And most of the time when you, I get to Ridley and I say, well, we could do this, or sometimes he's got his own idea. But if you get a painting, he would really like it because he, he, he likes to, to make a, a moving painting. That's what he does. In, in this movie, is very, very cinematic. What I'm really pleased in that battle is the music that uh, really enhance and spiritualize because the if you get it that's how so philosophical the movie could be the during that battle people are bashing each other killing each other drowning each other and out of nowhere in those woods you can hear Kirieli son which is a part of the mass the it's in greek but it's sang by a Corsican influence group. It's based on an 18th century Corsican manuscript. Maybe the kind of manuscript that Napoleon could have heard in his childhood from a Franciscan uh, chapel 
It has been rediscovered recently. So that's, you know, how accurate it is. And and this means, uh, Lord have mercy. It's very interesting to hear that during a battle. Uh, the director doesn't take sides, but just spiritualize the whole battle and to say, why did we do that? See, that's... I, I, I think it's a... It's a Nobody analyzed that, uh, so that's why I say that. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing it. And we're going to have to move through these portions real quick just to get to Waterloo because um, we're starting to run out of time here. But just to hit the Russian campaign real quickly, not that much is depicted of it. You, it, The film shows the army on the march, a little bit of raiding along the way, um, and then a big crowning moment when they arrive and they see a um, uh, an empty... Uh, Moscow, and then they later show it burning. So the set was really pretty. I know you maybe weren't a huge fan of it. I thought it was pretty cool visually. Um, maybe I'm not informed enough to critique it historically, but I thought it was it's pretty cool visually. Um, and I think behind the scenes, you were telling me that they actually chose um, places in the UK to represent uh, palaces. Yes, yes. Uh, so yeah, we shot um, the outside court is a, is a porch at Blenheim Palace. And then the inside of the Tsar um, Palace is uh, Westminster Cathedral. And it's actually, apparently, the first movie ever being shot in Westminster Cathedral. It was very interesting. A little behind the steel a scene anecdote. That's a funny story. I didn't, I, I didn't plan on saying it, but it's a very funny story. It's, so it was very hem empty, completely empty. And then Bridley asks, he says, could we have some dead leaf or something to make to make a sort of to occupy a bit and then everyone is on the Westminster Cathedral is right in the middle of London right so you have all those guys going with bin bags all around London running around to get dead leaf and they're running back to say look governor I've got I've got that and so, and they displayed it, but it was really interesting to see all these crew. It's not a historical anecdote, but it was very interesting to see all that. The inside of Westminster Cathedral is uh, quite a neo-Byzantine style, so it works quite well with uh, the depiction that they that they wanted to get. Got it. And we could talk more. We'll have to do a follow up for that. I'm going to keep us going. Um, speaking of battles, there's a ton that got cut in the film. Um, mostly it's suggested or reference, a reference for these other battles, but just here to give the audiences a sense of what is cut. Here's a map I found online. I think it was some Redditor put it together showing all of Napoleon's major battles. So you can see there's, you know, dozens upon dozens of them. Um, many of them could be mentioned. The major ones that I'll point out here is kind of naval battles. Don't see any of them. I don't think they're even referenced though. Battle of the Nile, Trafalgar, things like that. Um, other things that get cut is the early campaigns in Italy. I think at some point in the movie, there's even a quote that says, uh, Italy was taken or fell without action or something like that. So some of it is brushed aside. Yeah, the, there's a voiceover saying that. But it's based on um, on Napoleon, uh, one of Napoleon's letter. So it's, oh. uh, it's, an, accurate, <laughs> it's an accurate quote. But, but yeah, it would kind of misinform the audience there. Uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, and then other things that are missing entirely is the whole Peninsula War. I have some notes here. People no. want to read about it. I'm not going to. Um, more importantly is people were hoping that you might see Borodino. Uh, Borodino is actually in the movie. Uh, it's a very quick. Uh, you can just see one. Uh, that's when Napoleon's on his horse. And that's actually Borodino. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And I think the text does flash. But I guess people were hoping they would get more focus, and, and even Leipzig here with, I think it's that, the largest tough. battle of the wars. Um, but yeah, so a lot of a lot of stuff got cut that obviously people with a budget, if they were you know historical fans, would have tried to do everything. That's impossible for a film unless you make it a mini series. So it, it kind of makes sense that stuff had to get cut. Um, but I guess, yeah, did you have any comments on uh, the scoping of the film was there ever any a talk of just focusing it less so on the whole campaign and more so on just like early oh, Italy there, were, there were some battles that kept coming in and out mm. there were some battles that we didn't know 
uh, one day we were shooting them or the other day we went and so there was a lot of discussion uh, between the Ridley and producers and uh, studios about some wanted more battles so it was it was actually also a, an onset discussion because the budget yes is big but it's it's never that big you know that's right so and then Ridley always like a battle he always likes a battle so he, he really wanted to do more battles okay was there ever talk of trying to do like a tv series or, or break this out i guess it was always going to be a film yeah it was always going to be a film from what up from what i heard okay uh and then here we have to buzz through waterloo i wish we had more time but we'll have to make it pretty quick so i think just the depiction of the battlefield itself for people who have seen the film or who haven't here's a, a quick recap uh again it's kind of ridley's idea of kind of framing everything in a picture that looks nice and is maybe easily understandable from the general audience perspective but for people with a historical understanding there's a lot of critiques that you could have for this kind of simplified postcard version of it um, just to name a few the camp is right in front of the battle lines the artillery doesn't have good sight lines there's stakes here no unit formations and more importantly there's no famous landmarks Ugumol, other farmhouses and things like that um, from the actual battle depiction are just kind of thrown away um, so maybe just could you give us a 30 second one minute take on how we went from yeah. here to this postcard so well when i what what i can say is when i first arrived on set i knew that it was going to be like that but i was there was that discussion of, about the trenches and i couldn't believe that there would be trenches and when i arrived on set there were trenches so what can you do as a sort of advisor you can't say well let's not <laughs> do trenches yeah. yeah so uh, you've got to adapt to what's there and so uh, for Waterloo, we had a discussion with Ridley. We it was it, it's a great scene. It's a great behind the scenes scene. I was with producers, with uh, with I guess uh, actors, and um, at, at one point the military advisor was called too, and we were in a tent uh, before in Wellington's tent, and you had uh, his hat on the on the desk, and Ridley, everyone is smoking cigars from Nicaragua so with those big cigars and you're in that tent I'm not a smoker myself so it made me all a bit dizzy and you have to focus and they're like well we are heading to two weeks of shooting of Waterloo so what is going on what can we do and so me I really wanted to push in the story the grouchy incident so the fact that grouchy ramforts were supposed to come and the fact that napoleon actually won against the british and it's without the help of uh the reinforcements from blucher that napoleon would have won and so that got actually done and we had discussions and ridley actually drew a plan uh of of the battle and we we change things up and so that famous day and that famous meeting which looked so epic uh to me to be a uh, part of this uh of this story within the story uh actually influenced a little bit but then we've got to work with those extras you know it's in the 70s the famous the the archuk bridge is that how you call that movie uh oh i'm not i'm not familiar with it Okay, uh, the, the the famous movie that was done in 1970 uh, had 14,000 extras from the Russian army. Nowadays, oh, that's right. Yeah, the Waterloo film. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, you can't use uh, 14,000 military men, let alone <laughs> Russian ones, uh, for uh, a movie. So um, here we had 1,200 extras. I think, or 1,300 extras on, on the biggest day, which was insane. And uh, they were all trained to do those squares. And the main focus was to see the inside of the battle. So I was quite happy uh, with that and uh, with the this part of it. And the fact that Napoleon actually, you can actually see him, the fear in Wellington's eyes. You can actually see that. Okay, and now that we've covered the kind of general battlefield itself, there are some specifics about the battle that I wanted to cover. One of the major parts that does come up in kind of 
in the movie and in critiques is the sniper sequence. So again, what happens in the movie is basically before the battle begins, you have uh, a sniper on the British side. Here's the depiction of his uh, rifle with a scope, asked to take a shot at Napoleon. Wellington orders him not to take the shot on pain of death and states that generals already, already have enough on their hands. Um, the scene then doubles back at the end of the Waterloo sequence where he does take a shot at Napoleon, but it hits uh, his hat uh, and misses. So that's what's in the movie. The history is pretty interesting. We won't be able to get into all of it. Long story short is there was no sniper trying to hit Napoleon at Waterloo, as far as we know. Um, and then the hit, the history of snipers here is, is a little bit more interesting. Um, sniper rifles, so to speak, didn't really exist. I think the closest representation is like the Baker rifle, which has 180 meter range, and it was issued to some units that were present at Waterloo. So that's that. Um, but the actual like scope sniper with a crosshair and all that uh, just didn't exist in the period. So it's a little bit anachronistic in that sense. Um, so, okay, snipers, maybe you can stretch it to say it's a modified custom Baker rifle, whatever, with crosshairs that just happen to be there so that the audience understands what's happening. Okay, maybe. Um, the history of snipers, we could talk about this a little bit. They did feature in Napoleonic battles, um, although it was more so in the sense that there were just units that were light skirmishers that acted as a screening and harassing troops. So there were no really explicit snipers who went out. Um, but there are t there are some cases famously of officers being targeted, and I'll let you maybe talk about this if you wanted to. Yes, and uh, so in the movie first, the scope that is placed on top was a last minute Ridley thing. Uh, he really wanted to add the scope on top of it and to be like, well, we are going to depict the first sniper in world history. So it was a bit of uh, military uh, anachronism that was done on purpose and when i came to him he said to me he said uh, is that okay i was like no it's not okay but uh he's like it's funny like, i'm not sure people will see that as funny as you do um and uh, with the military advisor we advise the position you are just depicted right underneath uh, the accurate one of the accurate position laying down uh, to shoot and I wanted uh, Nelson to address him as uh, Plunkett, as Soldier Plunkett, as a reference to Thomas Plunkett, who famously shot General Colbert at half a kilometer distance. And interestingly enough, that is the distance we have in the movie between where Napoleon is standing in the movie, I'm speaking, and where the the supposed uh, Baker rifle, uh, the rifle regiment was. So it could have been accurate. A Baker rifle, uh, someone like a very famous um, first sniper man uh, could have done it, but um, he didn't address him as Plunkett and uh and really wanted uh, the sniper on top so you see that's one of those moments where uh, you advise and you say well we can make it accurate just by saying his name and uh, that didn't happen so you see that's when sometimes you've got those stories uh, that are added on top and uh, and there's too much involved that just saying addressing the guy as Plunkett would I make it accurate and did not get done. Um, that's where I I work. I work mostly in the detail of, of a movie, even though I was involved in big scenes, like I said, the coronation, the civil wedding, uh, scenes that were not military, but that were more done for, for the layout of people, even the content of the conversation. Or the Tilsit Treaty, where I was really involved too. Got it. And then, obviously, you said in the context of the film, it's about a half kilometer distance. Maybe it could be possible. Um, in, in reality, Napoleon was kind of nowhere near the front front lines. I oh, saw somewhere. Definitely. definitely. Yeah, and I I saw people on on Reddit trying to do a play by play. Where's Napoleon? Where are the rifles? All throughout the battle to see how close they ever got. And I think the count, the consensus was at least a mile, if not more, in the actual battle. So, um, 
So uh, in real life, the two lines, if we can speak that way, like between the red and the blue that you've got here on screen, uh, it's separated by a kilometer, which makes a 0 0.8, between 0 0.8 mile and one mile. Uh, that's sort of uh, the difference you have, and you can see now on the Waterloo battlefield, because uh, the cannon couldn't reach, so just further than what a cannon could reach. Uh, so it's impossible that uh, you could shoot with a Baker rifle from one camp to the other. Uh, but uh, in real life, where, not in real life, sorry, on sets um, where we were shooting, the two lines were separated from uh, half a kilometer, so half of sort of half of the distance that they would have been separated in real life, 500 meter, which is um, quarter of a mile, something like that. So, so it could have been done. It could it could have been done in a, in a, in in our in a, the distance that the movie shows. Yeah, and then, and then one thing historically also to add to, to people speculating, well, why why didn't they have snipers at Waterloo to hunting down Napoleon? And one thing historically to talk about is it's pretty rare to have accuracy up to half a kilometer. And even if you could, battlefields are quickly clogged with smoke and sound and stuff where it's really hard to see what's going on. So you have to add into that, um, that it's not ideal sniper conditions. Right. Um, but the, the purpose of it was also, sorry, Oh, go ahead. The, the the purpose of it was to show that, and it's true, here it's the only time a war in world history, it's the only time a war that scale has been done, not against France, not against an empire, not against the country or states, or really during that coalition of countries railing against Napoleon, the whole thing is against him personally. So that's why he, could, he was the target. And, uh, and that's why in the movie, there's that famous sort of um, uh, quote, apocryphal quote uh, that, um, that was done in other movies. So it's also a reference to the movie history that generals have better things to do than shooting each other. Yeah, and this is a story I think that maybe came from actually closer to Napoleon's time where there is this story about the artillery wanting to fire and Wellington says no. So yeah, there is that kind of made up but ancient story. But I think what you're referencing is actually um, changing the artillery firing to I think a sniper firing or something like that is more yes, from the yes. 1970s film, actually. Yes, where, where you have a similar it, scene with a, a, a rifleman. Yeah. Mm. Definitely. Okay, so there's a yeah, an homage or a reference to this earlier scene, and it's kind of justified as maybe possible because you're saying within the context of the film, they're half a kilometer. That's the range that Plunkett got his famous shot. So maybe it's possible. Uh, but then the the last edition of the scope is something that you protested <laughs> but was thrown in, <laughs> just kind of cuz. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And what, what was the thinking also for having this, the sniper reappear at the end and shoot Napoleon's hat? Was there any discussion about that? Uh, no, there was no discussion with me about that. It was just to also make it make it like um, Nelson was, uh, everything was a bit out of control and even the, you would, people would not follow, the British would not even follow the orders of their commanders and would just do whatever they could to also um, be part of history. So that was a bit, and it, I was not against it because it shows that Napoleon took risk by charging in that last, very last charge. If you represented the truth, which is Napoleon in his carriage, uh, people would have been like, oh, he's just one of them kings and he's not that, famous, I already said it, last fighting king that historians and, and everyone's been scared about. So his personal involvement and risk that he did, even in the end, is kind of true. Uh, even though here in the movie it's represented, of course, with the yeah, literally. extravaganza <laughs> of Ridley 
Ridley, <laughs> Ridley yeah. cinematography. I uh, I don't think you can historically be against that. Okay. Uh, and then moving on for more Waterloo stuff, I think there's general depiction of combat in the film that, whatever, any any movie that tries to depict ancient combat, there's going to be a critique of it. Um, so might as well do it for, for Waterloo. So there's a couple of things to point out. I think the first is Napoleon himself charging. We've kind of already addressed that, so I don't want to talk about it too much. Yeah. The basic idea driving this particular depiction is um, you wanted to show that Napoleon is an active participant in, in combat. Historically, he was a little bit on the front lines, or sorry, behind the front lines, but at least more involved than other kings. So you guys have kind of just dialed that up a little bit more to the extreme. Um, and then I and guess he, the other and he part... he gave his person to his spirit. To, to He gave himself as a sort of sacrifice, as a very Christic sacrifice uh, for not a uh, moral or whatever, but for either you can believe that it's his own ambition or for his dream that it was France and uh, the fact that, and the order that he tried to do over the anarchy of French Revolution. So actually in terms of the story we are saying, and even the history, I'm still not, uh, uh, upset about that. Okay. Uh, and then other stuff for actual like formations and then battle itself. In the movie, they depict the the British squares that famously happened. The context is different historically. It's kind of like up over a hill. I think Napoleon's forces thought that the British were reforming and retreating, hence the cavalry charge. But in this case, in the movie, it's like the British move out intentionally in clear sight of the French and then get ready to form their squares. So whatever, it's a little bit different in the way it's 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 shown to have taken place, but visually it's not too bad, I don't think. I don't know if you had anything else to to mark on the the squares and the cavalry charge. Well, uh, so yeah, I was not on during the shoot. I was not so much of a big fan of this representation, but I couldn't really grasp how it would look like. I really like the fact that you see it from the inside. And um, and the amount of the actual performance, cinematographic performance of shooting something like this means that every stuntman or extra does his job well because he's filmed at 12 cameras everywhere with shooting. So um, the military advisor, the stunt coordinator, and uh, the horse masters, everyone did a crazy job on that. But what I'm more involved in was, for example, the conversation uh, that um, Marshal Ney and uh, Napoleon had before, where to show that Napoleon was not, he was a bit ill at that moment, and that Napoleon was not too keen on that charge that would lead to the, the death of so many of his cavalry. And that we sort of get in the movie. Uh, and you, my purpose here was to really emphasize the fact that Napoleon is waiting for help for Ramfort and he's taking his time. That's what you've got in the music shows that well, that, that very piano da, 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 and uh, which is a reference to Barry Lyndon. And by the way, uh, is done that piano you hear is what you hear is actually uh, registered uh, and composed on Napoleon's piano, his real piano. So that, that's pretty good. And uh, so that I was, I tried to emphasize, uh, to emphasize, and that's sort of what we did within the dialogues. But then the whole layout of the battle I had no influence on that whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. And that'll be the biggest critique that we've already talked about. These battles are simplified, again, for the sake of kind of making a postcard image restraints on how many people can be mobilized and all that stuff and then trying to make it unique and something different so we've kind of gone over that uh, but then, you, you got it and then the the last thing that people have pointed out you that I'll, 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 I'll reinforce again is when the armies do actually clash um it kind of boils down to the cliche of hollywood everyone just kind of stabbing each other medieval style um a lot of people online myself included would have loved to see you know, an actual evolution of formations, columns of attack, you know, use of reserves that happened famously. So a lot more of the kind of actual depiction of, of how combat takes place was kind of lost. 
Um, and same thing goes particularly for Waterloo, explicitly calling out the role of the old guard and other kind of elite units. Out of a, a lot of this nuance of battle is lost for the Hollywood mash of guys in close quarters is is the main critique that maybe we could we could comment on. For for the old guard, if your heart is hurt, so is mine. I would have <laughs> loved them to be way more involved, uh, especially at that moment. It would have been great to be like Napoleon is abandoned by everyone, you know, in the story, not in history. Napoleon is abandoned by everyone except the whole guard that stands. And you you could even have said famous quotes, uh, the, the whole guard. Uh, stands but never surrenders you uh, never surrendered you could have added that it would have d done perfectly but it was not part of the story of uh, that they wanted to do but just historically i was not against that sort of uh people say medieval uh battle because accurately you've got yes evolution of formation yes columns of attack but um historians and osteoarchaeologists or people who analyze bones and wounds based on skeletons they realized that very few people died on the battlefield based on a shot you would actually most of the napoleonic battles would involve some sort of medieval ground battle like this at some point where the columns would join up um would uh, would get close enough so it, yes it's not the core of the battle but there is that possibility of uh facing and having that uh close combat medieval style however you want to call it it's not that accurate and uh that inaccurate i would say but the whole guard uh the old guard is definitely a miss for me okay yeah, and again, um, some of the scenes I'm showing here is from our, our true size series where we try and show what does stuff look like yeah. to scale in 3D. And that's what I would do if I had a Hollywood budget is actually show <laughs> this type of stuff. I agree with you that you know the final cracking of formations with a bayonet charge is really impactful, really important. It kind of shows the desperation of the moment. I just wish they had paused and kind of led up to that with, with some of these other you know CGI renders or, or something. Um, and and it it would have made Napoleon the tactician. We would have had yes. that that mask we were talking about. We would have had this and uh, and um, and, and the we, system we of like army we corps. So I agree with you. I'm not you know. Yeah, I agree. Fully agree. And the uh, by having the old guard, you would have had the the passion that people had and still have for the guy that. Even the whole world, which was the case during that coalition, the whole world gather against one man, but you still got men that have been turned, not only by propaganda, but by true love of the, the emperor and that everything he had would turn into a relic. So all that, uh, you, you could have had that by this moment. It was the key moment to show that. But as an advisor, you can't come up and be like, well, let's add five minutes to your movie that is four hour and 20 minute long by doing this scene that would cost you, I don't know how many, hundred of thousand. That's not my role. And so uh, even though it, it's very hard as an historian and as a, and, and when you think of, of the audience, we would, and people like you, people like your audience, millions of people would have loved that. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of the only one that represents them at that moment, but you, you can't do anything. It's, it's very hard, yeah, and I, very hard. And I was going to say one thing that I would love, and one of the reasons that I'm trying to do this True Size series on our channel is to inform general audiences and actually this is literally in my mind to try and have a resource for filmmakers where they can look at oh this is what it looks like in 3d and maybe this is how i could compose a shot so i'm hoping down the line these renderings that i do and other people maybe could influence films early enough where a director or someone pre-production is like oh this is this could be our postcard that does work it does translate to audiences i don't know do you see that being a resource that someone like Ridley might consume? Like, let's say this was presented to him early on or 
or someone in the film industry, is this something that you think could change the way they depict films or it's kind of a lost I'm not going to, sh- I'm not going to say names. I'm not going <laughs> to say names, but I think you would be happy to know that people, uh, from Hollywood have been watching your channel. Or oh, that's watching good. Your channel. <laughs> okay. Good. I and, hope they, uh, they watch and, this and series. We, we've been the... size. <laughs> that's I'm my goal. Sure. I'm like, come uh, on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay that's all i can say oh, okay okay cool um but yeah that would be my one wish if if ever there was a big historical movie with battles coming out if i could be hand them a sequence of it rendered in 3d as historically accurate just just to, to give them something to work with um early on because like we've seen once something is kind of set in the director's mind it's very hard to change it later so if there's any opportunity early on to front load the formations or some of this, you know, uh, definitely. Yeah. I, I would love that. Definitely. So that's, that's my, that's my idea for making this series. Um, but yeah, I think that's the bulk of Waterloo and the battles. Again, we could spend a lot more time getting into the nuances here, but I'm sensing that we're starting to repeat kind of some of the talks about direction limitations, all that stuff. So I think we've hit most of the topics. Um, so the last little point to conclude on here might be, the end of the movie, Napoleon's final exile. Um, maybe you could talk about this and then we'll do some closing thoughts. So I'll, I'll let you kind of take it away then. So as we said earlier, so there's a difference between history and the story, but you've got to also understand the visual impact of things. And somebody within the, um, when we prep this, you asked me, somebody of your community asked me uh, through you, um, were there things that, were not accepted. And for example, I advised that in the direction of Russia, people would take, um, the soldiers would take the, you know, the the piece of metal they used to reuse the, the weapon. How do you call that in English? Um, uh, uh, is it the ramrod or the bayonet? No, the ramrod, right? The ramrod, that's it. Um, so they would use that piece of metal and as they walked it would pierce the floor to check if people from poland uh and farmers and would not have hidden stuff uh and sometimes you, if you read uh, historical documents you hear that the army nobody would walk like this on the way back they would just be scavenging and looking for food and everything and the whole army was down planting this piece of metal down the floor and i said to ridley why don't you do that and it was like unless you add a, a scene where they actually discover this i will have my whole army looking like elder people walking with walking <laughs> sticks all the way yeah so sometimes an accurate thing an accurate thing can't be done because it's not explained to the story or it's not relevant so you have to go for something that is inaccurate or is not the true representation of an army or be- for visual purpose for example here you've got the image um of napoleon and wellington so the protagonist the antagonist whoever side you pick um and it's a beautiful scene uh we're actually shooting this on the real HMS Victory. So it's the very first movie that was done on this uh, historical boat. And look at the scene. Visually, it looks like uh, a chess piece, you know, a chess board. And you've got the two kings fighting uh, each other. Uh, This picture is amazing. And you, you have that discussion between them. And so you've got to... Me, I helped out with the dialogue and this scene, mostly when in this scene when he's got kids beforehand and Napoleon he says, um, you, I'll never make mistakes. And it's very funny because he, you just after Waterloo where he definitely made mistakes. And uh, so, and, and it's real quotes from Napoleon that, he, that Joaquin uses. And so that's where I get involved. But you've got to understand that scenes like this that are not accurate have to be placed sometimes for the audience or for uh, the purpose of um, Ridley's Ridley's wish. He's like a painter, as you can see, and you've got to 
you've got the the director of photography who's, who's going to prepare the paint and somebody like me like me is preparing pigments and then you give that to director of photography and Ridley is the one that holds the paintbrush so you've got to understand your place you're not here to do the painting yourself it's not in your movie that's why I'm not here as uh and the lawyer of the movie <laughs> uh, and um and I think to wrap it up uh, what you see in St. Elena is uh I, I think is a pretty good depiction you've got that Corsican music every time he it goes from an island. You can see him going towards an island, either Elba or St. Helena. You've got that Corsican music because it's a reference to Napoleon coming from an island, which is Corsica. And they, they are really in... Uh, we can't really throw that movie like this. There's really layers and in-depth and details that, yes, I was there to defend and uh, sometimes we added... And there was so much research to be done. It's and uh, in Saint Helena, we did a pretty good job. And it's a very aesthetic movie. The thing is, this movie: the less you know about Napoleon, the more you like the movie. <laughs> I'm not sure if you <laughs> yeah. noticed uh, with yeah. friends around you. The less they know about Napoleon, the more they like the movie. It's not very good for people like me who were dedicated years uh, on this project, but it's very impressive um, how. The visual side of things took over the historical side of things on this matter yeah okay well i think that's a great conclusion uh i think we've hit most of the embedded audience questions we hit most of the topics that people voted on so i think that is the bulk of it so again thanks everyone for watching thank you dr chevalier for for you know taking this long form interview i think this was great um, if there's enough audience questions, I'll try and answer them in the comments below. Maybe we'll be able to have you back on. Um, but in any case, look forward to the director's cut and hopefully seeing you again soon. So if you have any parting words or anything you wanted to plug on your end, feel free. Otherwise, I think I'm uh, I'm good to go. Well, thank you so much, Julien, for the prep of this interview and the interview itself and for the channel. The channel is great. It's a great, great resource. Um, and thank you for all the guys uh, and the ladies watching this uh, because it's a it's a very it's a very good uh, channel um, and a very well sourced and perhaps it could be used someday for um, making a movie. Who knows? <laughs> I'm hoping. I'm hoping that's <laughs> the goal. We, we, we've understood. We understood the the bottle thrown to the sea, as we say. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next time. All right. Thank you. Thanks Bye. so much. Bye, Julia.